Welcome everybody. Uh, this is our last bit of notes before um, for, before our genetics test and for that matter, before the AP bio test. So um, this one is a exciting one to do. I enjoy this a lot. This is some of the coolest stuff that there is in biology these days. Um, and I doubt you fully appreciate what this is, this image, um, but these are, all those little dots are actually glowy DNA. It's glow-in-the-dark DNA, and I'll explain how that works a little bit later. But um, we'll sort of start off with the basics here, okay? Um, so, central dogma here. The big idea is that a gene is going to be transcribed into messenger RNA, and that messenger RNA is going to be translated into a protein. And that works the same way in virtually every organism on the planet. So the general idea here is that we can take any gene from any organism and we can put it in another organism and they should express it just the same way. Um, there are some challenges with this, so I don't want to make it seem that it is so easy. But uh, for the most part, we've found that this idea works, that you can take uh, genes from one organism and put them in another. And for that matter, we actually have gotten to the point where we've actually talked about sort of designer proteins, proteins that don't exist in nature, but we're actually synthetically producing them. So that's another possibility. And when I say synthetically producing, we're still producing them inside an organism. We're just creating the DNA from scratch. So very exciting stuff. Um, so what is the purpose behind this. So here's uh, little examples of us taking a bacteria and what we're doing is we're taking some genes from a human or some other organism, putting them in that bacteria. And what we can do with that is create some pretty amazing results. Um, we can insert a gene into the bacteria that will actually have them consume oil. So that's great for oil spills. Um, we can insert genes into plants like corn that allow them to be resistant for certain pests. We can, insert, we can produce proteins that are not able to be produced any other way. For example, human growth hormone or a um, or proteins that help dissolve blood clots. So those are all examples of things that we can now do that. For example, we used to, people that were diabetic, we used to get the insulin from horses. We now don't do that anymore because um, we actually use human insulin instead of horse insulin, which is better for us, obviously. And in order to harvest it, we simply took the insulin gene out of a human and we put it into a bacteria and we raise the bacteria in a petri dish and we're able to harvest the insulin that way and it makes this human insulin even though it's produced by a bacteria so how does this work so we what we've really done is borrowed some of these processes from nature so bacteria already do this and we've talked about this the idea of transformation remember the griffith experiment with the mice and um, the bacteria exchanging dna Conjugation is another way in which bacteria uh, do this. And transduction is a way that viruses actually spread the DNA. So all these are considered what are called vectors. Vectors transfer DNA from one organism to the other. Um, and the most common type of vector is this thing called a plasmid. Plasmids are really small circular pieces of DNA. They usually contain anywhere from one to a dozen or so genes. And what we can do is we can force or coerce, I should say, a bacteria into taking up these pieces of DNA. Um, and that's the real start of all this, is that we are able to do that. Now, plasmids work great for bacteria, which is where a lot of this research is. But eventually, we want to get to the point where can we take a gene and put it into a human cell? And plasmids don't work that way but we are learning a lot about viruses. We're making these synthetic viruses and you know by now that viruses actually land on cells and then they actually will turn, um, inject their DNA or their genetic material into the cell. So we're sort of borrowing that idea and saying, okay, what if we can create a synthetic virus that actually 
infect its DNA. And when I say its DNA, it's the DNA we give it so we can put whatever we want in it. Um, and we can now inject DNA into the cells because this is the, that's a big problem for an adult human. We're trillions of cells. So in order to get something to change, we can't just change one cell. We have to change um, billions and billions of cells. We maybe don't have to change every cell in the human body, but um, a good example of, of this idea, and this is not in practice yet, but we're working on it, is the idea of cystic fibrosis. People with cystic fibrosis have a problem in their lungs that they actually produce uh, a transport mechanism that is faulty and it starts pumping, it essentially causes fluid to fill the lungs. This is obviously bad and can cause early death in people. So um, people have talked about the idea of creating a sort of cold-like virus or even something like the coronavirus where, but instead of the DNA that is normally in those, we actually take that and we um, insert a gene that is a good version of the cystic fibrosis gene. And that gene would be inserted into the lung cells when you infect that person with the virus. And essentially, it cures them. It fixes the cells that are broken. So, um, so some problems with this. So there's a couple of challenges, and we'll get to each one. But one of the challenges is that DNA is a little bit difficult to deal with because it doesn't just come neatly packaged. It's messy sometimes. So first of all, in general, it comes in very large chunks. And so one of the thing, one of the challenges is we want to be able to cut up the DNA in smaller little bits so that we can manage it. So we can cut out a gene, for example. Not we don't want ten genes. We just want one gene. So we have to be able to cut that gene out. The other challenge is that we need to be able to sort those genes. So make sure that once we cut them up, we put them into nice, neat little piles and say, OK, this gene's here, this gene's there. And then the last challenge is getting those new genes back into the organism. And that's probably the most difficult. The first two we've pretty much completely solved. So the first one we've, problem we've solved with restriction enzymes. Restrictions enzymes are DNA scissors. They are naturally occurring and they are, they're found in bacteria. Bacteria don't have a really good way of defending against viruses. They don't have an immune system like us. And one of the ways in which they defend themselves is when they sense that a virus is around, they will spit out these enzymes called restriction enzymes. What they do is they cut up DNA, which essentially destroys a virus. And that is that little mechanism is something that we've borrowed now and actually use because we can now take these enzymes that it, we borrowed from the bacteria and we can put, mix it with any DNA um, and it can cause that DNA to be cut up. And the coolest part about it is many of these restriction enzymes only break the DNA at very specific sites. They actually have target sequences that they look for. So we know where it's going to break the DNA. Um, and it also, and this is an added bonus, is that it produces, usually it doesn't cut the DNA straight across. It cuts it and it produces what's called a little sticky end where there's a single strand that sticks out instead of the double strand. And the coolest part about that is when you cut DNA with the same enzyme, you end up with two sticky ends that match together. So that's the way in which we can help glue these back together. So we use an enzyme called DNA ligase to glue it back together, and you've already heard of that. So that's, this is that idea, is we have an, a restriction site here along the DNA. It's specifically looking for this pattern, G-A-A-T-T-C, comes along, it cuts it, and see these little sticky ends, these little single stranded sequences that come out. This is another gene that's been cut with the same enzyme, and notice it has the same sticky ends. And so those sticky ends stick together. That's why they call them sticky ends. And then we can use DNA ligase to glue it back together. Um, here's an example, and you do not need to memorize. These are uh, examples of common restriction enzymes. Notice they're named for the bacteria. So probably one of the most famous ones is the ECOR1, and it looks for that GAATTC. 
Um, one of the weirdest things, if you notice, all these sequences are palindromic, meaning that they actually are the same forwards and backwards. So um, we don't know exactly why that is, but it seems to be the case. Um, here's a little video that shows us this. So there's our little circular piece of DNA found in a bacteria. This is a plasmid. Again, it's much smaller than a normal bacterial chromosome. Here we have our DNA close up, our double helix, and then this is our restriction enzyme. And notice it kind of spins along and it is going to be looking for the right sequence. And when it finds the right sequence, it's going to stop and cut. And notice that each of those ends has a little bit of a single strand and those things match up. And then we can take DNA ligase and we can start to glue that back together. And now we have a new piece of DNA and we've got to just glue that other end back together. And then we will get a complete set, okay? Um, so that's, um, we once we've actually cut out a gene, we do this thing called cloning a gene. That is a way of sort of replicating the gene and making sure we have lots of it. The, old way and I'm not, I don't want to say it's old because it's first of all not that old and second of all we still use it for many purposes but we would take those genes and we would basically insert them into a bacteria and let the bacteria continue to replicate it in fact we've done this so much that we have all human dna every bit of human dna in different strains of bacteria so that they're producing human DNA and we have that replication. So, um, and we can, we can screen and find certain genes in them. So this is just showing you this idea that we take the bacteria, we cut up plasmid DNA, and we, in this case, we're inserting hummingbird DNA and we um, insert that hummingbird. Notice the eat, there's little piece genes inserted into that. This one didn't get one. And what we were able to do is, um, when we see this little white culture here, we know that that's this gene. And so we know it didn't get a new gene. And so we can actually eliminate it. But the blue ones are carrying this extra hummingbird DNA and we can slowly but surely figure out what different bacterial strains contain which part of the hummingbird DNA. Um, um, okay, so, so there's, a lot of ways in which we can do this, but one of the ways we the, one of the ways in which we screen is using these disrupted genes. What we do is we take a gene like LAC-Z, is a famous one that produces that blue color. And when the blue color isn't there, we know we've disrupted it, and that helps us screen these genes. But I'm not going to get into the details of this. But the idea there is that we can sometimes we don't necessarily have to read the DNA exactly. We can actually figure it out. Um, and I'm going to take a break after this, but the DNA libraries, so we've produced these libraries of all these genes, and we've done this for many organisms, obviously humans, um, obviously certain bacteria, yeast, all kinds of things. And what we've done is created these libraries that include all of the genome. Um, we've, there was a big push in the late 90s and early 2000s to actually uh, figure out all human DNA and read all of that. It's called the Human uh, Genome Project. And they did this largely by what's known as the shotgun approach, which means that they actually didn't worry about where they were reading the DNA. They were just reading random bits of DNA. And so that's why they call it the shotgun approach. And when they were, what they did is eventually when they had all these little sequences figured out, they started to glue them together like a puzzle in a, in a computer. They started to stack them together. So it was a really cool idea. There's a, um, Craig Ventner is one of the guys that was most famous for it. And he's won the uh, Nobel Prize for his work on that. So um, there's also these cDNA libraries that are actually a little bit different. Instead of genomic um, DNA, sorry, um, nuclear DNA, it's actually looking at RNA, which is kind of cool. These cDNA libraries tell you what genes are turned on in the cell. So that's another very cool mechanism that we're going to use a little bit later on. All right, I'm going to pause and I'm going to go to the next video. I'll see you over there.